Star one. Hi everyone, sorry for the delay. Um, welcome to today's webinar. Today our panelists will be presenting on the latest in HR, finance, and employment law in Europe. A recorded version of this webinar and slide deck will be emailed to you after this presentation to the email address you registered with. If you'd like this sent to a different address, please send us an email at marketing at globalupside.com. We'd love to hear, your, hear from you with feedback and questions during the webinar. Please enter any questions or technical issues that may come up during the event into the chat box located on the bottom of your screen. These questions will be answered at the end of the session during our Q&A portion. First up, I'd like to introduce Raghu Bargava, Global Upside CEO. Raghu is an award-winning entrepreneur who has spent his career at Global Upside helping companies tackle accounting, payroll, HR, and compliance challenges in over 100 countries. Prior to Global Upside, he held leadership positions at several companies, including Deloitte and NetIQ. Now over to you, Raghu. Thank you, Maggie. And welcome everyone to the webinar. And before we get started, I'd like to just uh, introduce uh, Ma uh, Geraldine, who's my co-panelist. Uh, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm a senior associate in the Employment Pensions and Benefits Group in Matheson. Um, Matheson is an Irish law firm. I'm currently on secondment to Matheson's office in San Francisco and Palo Alto. Um, I advise clients across various industries and all aspects of the employment relationship from recruitment to termination of employment. Um, and the majority of my work involves representing international companies doing business in and from Ireland. Thank you, Geraldine. And with that, uh, let's uh, go over into the um, agenda for today. And um, I know we have uh, Adam Sheffield from Global PEO Services who's supposed to speak also, but we're having some technical difficulties and he's not being able to connect. So uh, we'll have to you know, have you hear him at some other event um, coming up. But in terms of today's agenda, what we wanted to do is, as you expand overseas, we want to talk about the location, the footprint, how how big your operations are going to be, the entity set up, what do you need to worry about there, finding the right talent, how do you find people, how do you hire them, employment law issues, tax and accounting support, um, a little bit of managing the global operations, so whether you're in one country or many, how do you manage all of that? compliance issues, and I'm sure a lot of you are very anxious to hear about the GDPR or general data protection regulations that are coming up. Uh, we all have to comply by May 1st on that. And then we'll cover a little bit of Brexit, just to give you a perspective on what's uh, our perspective on what's going on and how it may or may not impact your future thinking about uh, going into Europe. <laughs> With that, let me get started on um, on uh, the setup and strategy aspects of a expansion. And some of this, even though it has a flavor of EU, it is a little bit more broader than you. So no matter which country you're looking into, you know these are the same questions you want to answer. Is first of all, where to? And where to has the broader concept of why are you expanding and what are you trying to achieve in that foreign country? You could be going into a foreign country for, say, a purpose of building an R&D team because of a availability of a particular type of talent, or you want to do set up manufacturing because you could get some tax credits from that country. You could be going into a country like Netherlands or Ireland or Switzerland to set up a tax structure to minimize some of your corporate taxation and stuff like that. But this, this, is, the, this is the thing that you have to figure out first. Why are you expanding? Why are you going into that particular country? And then once you know that, then you kind of have an idea of what your startup activities are going to look like. Uh, are you going to, uh, you know, if you're if you're going to set in, uh, if you're going to set up manufacturing operations, then you need to think about uh, acquisition of uh, property, whether you buy or lease. Um, versus if you're just opening a sales office because you think there's a lot of uh, opportunity with your customer base. <coughs> Then you're thinking, how do I find the right talent, sales talent to, to build on? But before you even get to it, one of the questions you have to answer is, uh, 
depending on the nature of your business and what you're trying to do is what are your options in terms of setting up in that country and in most countries allow some kind of a rep office type setup which is limited to typically uh, R&D type act, uh, research activities in terms of understanding the local market and not research in terms of uh, developing a product um, and then as you move off that research uh, activity then you really have to go set up a branch or a subsidiary now a branch can do business uh, in uh, accepting as, as a sales entity, uh, sales location. But really, if you are going to go do manufacturing or hire a bunch of people in that country for whatever the purpose might be, then you have to think about the subsidiary model. And the reason is that to lease property, to, to build facilities, to sign up for all the things that you need to sign up for in, in these countries, you do need a legal entity. And even though the branch can be allowed, what you're doing is you're creating a permanent establishment or a tax nexus for the U.S. parent company or the owner of the branch in that foreign country, which means now you have to, the, the foreign entity, the owner has to comply with those local requirements, whatever those might be, over and above um, income taxes. And so, and if something goes wrong, um, then the parent company is on hook for those liabilities versus if you had a subsidiary, then there's obviously um, the corporate whale that protects your parent company operations versus the local operations. Once you establish that, then you have to worry about the accounting, tax, and money movement considerations. The accounting setup, obviously, if you have a subsidiary, you need to keep a full set of books in local currency and stuff because those are what will be required at the end of the year for compliance purposes like income taxes things like that um, uh, and and that's the tax consideration from an income tax perspective but you also in most western european countries what you have is a vat or value added tax now value added tax is not like our sales tax systems it's an input output tax and and um, <coughs> excuse me and it's treated very differently. Now, some countries like UK allow you to not register for VAT if you are smaller than a certain size because they don't want to have that compliance burden on the entity. But as soon as your start, operations start to grow, you have the second or third person, your operations become big enough where you are required to register for VAT. And VAT in some respects is like sales tax where the filing frequency is dictated by your volumes. So initially you might have an annual filing requirement which could come down to quarterly or monthly as your business grows and expands in that country. Money movement is important because in this day and age with all the um, money laundering and um, uh, terrorism activities, it is very, very hard to open bank accounts in foreign countries. Even though you may have a global, uh, large global bank um, that you're banking with in, in the US. Uh, and so you need to think about how are you going to make that payroll payment, how are you going to make the um, payroll tax payments, lease payments, other expenses that you incur in that country as you build up, and how much time will it take you for to set up your own bank account so that you will you may not need a third party's money movement service uh, to manage that operations or pay for it. The permanent establishment, like I said earlier, comes from establishing a branch. But if you establish a subsidiary, then obviously that subsidiary is has a permanent establishment there, but the rest of the organization is protected from a permanent establishment in that foreign country. And generally, that's a good idea. Obviously, if you have one person who's just doing some research out there, you don't need to worry about permanent establishment, if, especially if you set up like a rep office and on a very short term basis. At some point, your operations do start to grow. And you cannot have like five people doing research on the market in, say, UK, because the government says, hey, look, the market isn't big enough for you to hire five people to do this research over a three year period. Figure it out fast and then you need to act upon it. And depending on, on the, the nature of the operations, you may have IP or intellectual property issues that you have to address, because if you are doing R&D um, in, in a foreign country, then with lacking any other contract or proper setup, uh, that IP that is developed in that country belongs to that country or that entity. And so 
in the future, if you decide to move it to some other jurisdiction, um, even within the EU, so moving from, say, Germany to France, you it will be subject to tax at an arm's length transaction. So you actually have to sell it to the French entity and German would have Germany would have to pay tax on it. Um, similarly, if you move it to the US, same rules apply. But obviously there are ways uh, to sign contracts and um, make arrangements with your subsidiary to, to do the development for you, uh, to find the talent and do the development. But uh, the ownership of the product, the developed product, will reside with the parent company or say an Irish company, even though your product is being developed in uh, in Germany, as an example. So there are ways to structure all of this. The reason we bring up Eastern Europe here is, is, is mainly because Eastern Europe has a lot of talent. They have some very good universities. They're creating some highly talented engineers, and it is becoming a big hub for R&D purposes for many, many companies. The only thing, only word of caution here when you expand to Eastern Europe is that you may not be able to build an R&D center with 5,000 people because the population isn't big enough. There isn't enough engineers there or engineers with the right talent that you may need uh, to build that kind of a team. Uh, and, and again, a little bit of it depends on which country you go to. And if you could hire 5,000 people, you might put 15 other companies out of business because they would have nobody else left to work for them. Uh, from a, from a regional center perspective, uh, Ireland, Netherlands, Switzerland, these are three countries that have been around for a long time in terms of um, tax structure and how you manage your operations in those countries to, to minimize your overall ta tax strategy. And these are things that you need to consult with a, with a tax advisor, uh, not something that you want to just take easy and say, yeah, let me just go to Ireland and I'll set this up on my own. Those things are uh, are um, strewn with pitfalls, and if you haven't given it proper thought, then you can end up in 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 trouble um, setting up, trying to set up a structure that might work for you. On to the next slide, we talk about um, employment law, and um, the biggest difference that we have to think about from an employment law perspective is in the U.S., employment is at will. So you as an individual, I as an individual could walk into my supervisor and say, hey, I'm leaving, today's my last day, and there's absolutely no obligation. There's no way the employer can make you stay or work. Or the employ, employ, employer can fire one of us uh, without any consequences necessarily, um, because there is no obligation for the employer to keep me on payroll and, and provide me work. In the rest of the world, employment is a matter of contract it's not a matter of free will so what you're doing is two parties an employer and an employee a candidate are getting together and signing a contract sometimes these contracts can be 15 16 pages long um, in many countries uh, there is a bilingual bilingual requirement uh, for the contract to be enforceable yes the english language may say everything that is required to be said properly and, and legitimately, but if it isn't in, say, French or German, the German or French courts might say this is an invalid contract because you did not provide it to the local citizen, local employee in their local language. So even though they read and talk and understand English, because it's not their primary language, it becomes an invalid contract. So, so there, are, there are things that you have to worry about, even at the contract stage of who you are, uh, who you're getting the template from, is that template valid in that country, and is that template bilingual or not? On top of it, there is Works Council and Collective Bargaining Agreements, or CBAs, as they are commonly known in this industry. And these CBAs, many times, are a benefit to the company. Sometimes they can be detrimental. So the Works Council, as an example, in France, uh, there's a lot of negativity around it, but if you go to the Nordic countries, a CBA is a great idea because then you're not negotiating a change in benefit or a change to the work environment with each employee. And imagine having 300 employees versus dealing with the with the union with the uh, under the CBA. And and if you can convince the union that this is the right answer going forward for whatever reason, then the rest of the members just adopt that, and there is no room to challenge it. Uh, Otherwise, you've got a big challenge. Um, 
there are working time regulations and uh, uh, what that does is that requires you to track time and report time and the government has an uh, authority to write to come and audit and review your records to make sure that you not only kept them but they kept them in a proper auditable manner and you can prove pro prove to the government that such and such employee worked such and such hours from such and such date to whatever and those are those are all of the requirements that apply there because employment is by contract you actually are upfront promising a lot of stuff to the employees for example vacation so in the us we can have a no vacation policy which means you can take whatever you want off but if you gave me that same contract in france i may never show up to work and you cannot make me come to work because you said i could take all the time off and i took a year off deal with it so those are those are some of the realities you obviously have other consequences of beach uh, breach of contracts um, and, and, and part of that is you, you, you have to commit up front in terms of what happens at the point of termination. There might be severance benefits commitments, there might be notice period commitments, things like that. Some of this is customary by the country. And even though it's all EU, European Union zone, uh, it is still country to country. There are differences in employment law. And I think Geraldine is gonna talk a lot more about that. And as you hire people, um, in the U.S. as an example, there are no requirements to provide any benefits to any of your employees other than uh, the payroll taxes that the employer has to contribute. Uh, so if Global Upside decides that they want to offer health benefits, well, they have the right to do that. Uh, nobody can force. Well, actually, health benefits did change with the, with the Affordable Care Act, but most other benefits, there are no requirements. In most countries, there are two levels of benefits the statutory benefits and the supplemental benefits statutory benefits are for example in uk a pension requirement that is statutory you cannot get out of it uh, as the employer and as the employee uh, and the pension plan is is very similar to it's a defined contribution plan not a defined benefit plan and it is very similar to our 401k plan but over and above if you want to attract the right talent you may need to offer say a better contribution matching contribution to the pension plan you may want to offer more life insurance you may want to offer better health plan that you can go to a private doctor versus just going to the government doctor those benefits are then considered supplemental benefits and you need to understand those and be able have the ability to implement those as you hire and build your team because with the first employee what we have seen first few employees people go in and say yeah yeah we will pay you a thousand dollars and you can go acquire those benefits but as your population grows that kind of methodology doesn't work you actually have to acquire those and provide those and then uh, you know from an employment law perspective you obviously have to worry about the staffing how do you find these people how do you interview the whole hiring process talent acquisition process of how do you find how do you uh, interview how do you make an offer? How do you bring them on payroll? Uh, and more importantly, how do you know what is the right salary for this part type of skill set in that country? And there are differences. Uh, the currency might be the same, but there are differences in pay rates from country to country. Uh, and, and depending on the unemployment rates, I was in Spain last week, and in Spain, the unemployment rate is very high, so salaries obviously are a little lower, than a country like Germany where unemployment, where the economy is booming, uh, so the unemployment rate is low. On to the next one, this is about compliance. So we've talked about setup, we've talked about hiring people. So now we have to worry about what else do we need to worry about from a setup perspective and an ongoing business perspective. So one of the things that most countries, including US require is to have a registered office. Uh, most companies in the U.S. are, are Delaware corporations, so they have a, some agent in Delaware that provides them that facility. Similarly, in every country, you need a registered office that is local to that country. So if the note, government needs to give notice or somebody needs to sue you, they know where to send the notice. And that's really the ultimate purpose of the registered office. Um, uh, resident director. Now, many countries in Europe do not require a resident director, for example, UK. 
but many countries require a resident director like Netherlands and others um, because it, a lot of times, and it is also dependent on what you're trying to do in that country. And most, most times these resident directors have a lot of authority, a lot of power over the actions of that local subsidiary. Sometimes they have, actually most times they have more power than a board member of the parent company based here in the US. So you have to be very careful as to who do you appoint as a resident director. Sometimes it is very hard to actually remove a resident director, and even if they may have committed some fraud or whatever, because you have to prove all of that before you can take them off. And meanwhile, they can be getting you into more, tr more trouble. And when you think about substance over form, so this is where you, you're, you're putting a tax structure in place in Netherlands, and if you don't have a local resident director, that tax structure is not going to hold because if you have nobody there and, and no real operations, the government is going to look at you and say, well, this is just a farce you've created, and so we're not going to allow any tax benefits to you for any reason. Obviously, many countries require data protection registrations, and these are all, um, again, slightly different requirements by country, but basically um, it, it is a very small slice of, uh, of GDPR, if you can think of it that like that. And th these rules have been around for a very long time, and most times it is, it is an annual registration renewal that you have to address. Taxes, I talked about this, VAT, income taxes, obviously payroll taxes, things like that, filing requirements and stuff. On an annual basis, most companies, uh, most countries outside of the US require a statutory audit. It does not matter what your revenues are or what your turnover is, you have to get a statutory audit done. And once this audit is done, and it is not a three paragraph opinion that you're getting from the auditor, you may be getting a two page, three page opinion because they have to opine on a lot of things at, the, at a great level of detail. And once these, once the audit is done, you have to prepare what's called an annual report and file it with the registrar of companies uh, for, for company law compliance purposes. And again, there are complexities in this and timing requirements and stuff like that. And many countries have different year ends. We're very used to December 31, uh, even though many companies in the U.S. have a fiscal year that is different than the calendar year. Uh, similarly, in, in uh, U.K., as an example, the the payroll year ends on the fourth, on the fourth or fifth of April, and and the year ends on Mar in March. So you have to worry about some of these things in terms of how this is all going to play out for you, and how do you have the right expertise to be able to comply with those requirements? Moving on to some of the day-to-day -day accounting and payroll requirements, obviously from a from a key filing and deadlines, you need to understand what you're subject to, what you're required to do. Um, in many countries, your January payroll net pay is paid in January, but your payroll taxes might be paid in February. Do you understand those things? Do you understand that there is a fixed date you have to pay by? Do you understand that uh, the payroll in many, in most countries is run once a month uh, versus our varied system of weekly to bi-weekly to semi-monthly uh, and everything in between. And what are those reporting requirements around those? Um, even, even just like the reporting requirements between New York and California are different, uh, similarly these countries have their own reporting requirements which are typically very different than what we are used to in the US. Then there's the concept of two sets of books management accounts and statutory accounts. Statutory accounts have to be maintained under local uh, accounting standards. Most countries have adopted IFRS, so in theory you understand those and, and easier to, easy to follow if you understand IFRS, but most countries also have their own version of IFRS versus just the overall version. And then uh, from a management perspective based in here in the U.S., they want U.S. GAAP financials. They want to look at those uh, financials in a different manner, different light, different cut. And so you may end up with two sets of books, the statutory books, which then get audited and uh, turn into a tax return and filed with the, with the country, and management set of books, which are under U.S. GAAP and are used for reporting. And you have to be very careful when you have two set of books that you don't get them out of sync. Because if you get them out of sync, then at some point down the road, you're gonna to have to pay a big price to somebody to figure out where the differences came about and how to reverse those. 
So we, I talked about the IFRS standards, so year end local gap. Okay, obviously local gap is the IFRS um, and, and, and you have to maintain those books. Corporate taxes, payroll taxes, W-2s, the equivalent of W-2s, uh, all of that applies um, in, the, in the accounting and payroll arena. And again, beyond that payroll, which is essentially the first thing you start with, you have the issues of ARAP and uh, policies and processes around that. I've talked about VAT already, so I'm not sure that there is any much more to talk about here. But um, you know, one one thing I'd like to bring up is the storage. So if you move your goods through Europe and you store them in a location, that can create PE for the owner of the of that those goods. And then expect the unexpected in terms of acquisitions, because acquisitions are always, always, always very complicated. You may have a lot of issues to worry about, and um, and you know how do you manage through that? And and some of those rules, GDPR rules that you have to comply with on a standalone basis, you have to worry about from an acquisition perspective about exchanging information, data transfer across borders, and things like that. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Geraldine. Sure. Thanks, Raghu. Um, to kick off, just as we have the slide there, I'll just give you a brief overview of Matheson. Um, so Matheson is a full-service Irish law firm headquartered in Dublin, and we have offices in London, New York, Palo Alto, and San Francisco. Um, as a firm, our focus is on serving the Irish law needs of internationally focused companies doing business in and from Ireland. So um, we act for the majority of the Fortune 100 companies, um, some of the world's largest tech multinationals and high profile startups. And I suppose we have a strong presence where our clients are located, which illustrates um, the reason why we are in both New York and as well as San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Um, so in terms of I suppose hiring options then, I know Raghu touched on on it when he was talking about employment law. Um, but really I suppose there are four main categories or options available to businesses when they're looking at operating overseas. Um, the first is to engage independent contractors, and the second is direct employees or direct hires. And the third is by way of a PEO or professional employer organization model. And the fourth would be to engage workers through an agency, which is slightly different to the PEO. So for the purposes of the webinar today, um, I'll just look at the, the main pitfalls from an employment perspective of engaging contractors versus employees, because it's something that comes up quite commonly in practice. Um, so I suppose once a contractor is engaged, there are certain misclassification risks that may arise. And hiring somebody as a contractor, but in reality, treating them in the same way as an employer, or as an employee even, can expose the company to risks under employment law, um, under tax laws, insurance um, can be an issue, and also um, employers are vicariously liable for the acts of their employees. So um, where you have an independent contractor who is in fact um, an employee, um, that can open up issues and exposures in that context also. So I suppose a practical tip uh, to deal with this is it's important to get the documentation right for, for certain, and that should be done from day one. Um, but the, the documentation in and of itself isn't sufficient um, to, I suppose, document or justify an independent contractor arrangement. Um, it's important that the day-to-day -day arrangements um, and working arrangements of that independent contractor reflect or support the fact that he is he or she is operating independently. Um, so issues such as control, um, you know, exclusivity of service, whether they can work for other competitors, um, you know, whether they invoice the company, um, all of those issues would be relevant in determining the status of a contractor versus an employee. And then just another point to, to note in terms of engaging independent contractors, and again, it's a point that Raghu touched on, is protection of intellectual property rights. So under common law, and um, certainly in Ireland, any IP rights created by an employee during the course of employment would automatically vest in the employer. Um, now, 
co companies and employers will still have certain protections and get in included in the contract of employment to uh, bolster these protections. Um, but that's worth bearing in mind that if you do engage an independent contractor, any IP rights created will not automatically vest, and then a company will need to ensure that it has adequate IP assignment agreements in place with that contractor as well, and particularly relevant for, for anyone in the R&D or tech space, um, that you, you cover that off from the outset. And just to look at direct hires then, so um, I suppose with with any company who is looking to engage employees in any country in Europe, it's important to uh, be aware that they need to consider local employment laws and payroll requirements in that particular country. Um, every country is different in Europe in terms of their minimum requirements and thresholds. Um, there are significant protections for employees under employment law in Europe, as, as Raghu alluded to also. Um, for example, discrimination laws are EU-wide. Um, they are less, I suppose, relevant or significant in some countries where there are strong unfair dismissal rights, um, but they're still very much um, a factor to be considered when you are engaging employees in the manner in which employees are paid or treated, their working conditions. Um, as Raghu also alluded to, there are um, very different holiday and leave entitlements for employees in Europe versus in the US. So I suppose in the US for the most part, workplace benefits such as maternity or paternity leave or um, parental leave and paid time off um, or vacation time would be agreed with the employee as part of the overall remuneration package. Whereas in Ireland, as in other countries throughout the, the Europe, such benefits are mandated by legislation. Um, so as Raghu says, you know, where there are a statutory requirement, then there is no getting out of it. Um, so this generally will result in employees in Ireland having much more generous leave entitlements than their colleagues perhaps in the US. Um, so again, just something to, to consider and, and get advice on from the outset. Um, employment contracts and policies are, as Raghu mentioned, very common in Ireland, a written employment contract. Um, so they, they essentially will set out the parameters around employees' statutory minimum entitlements and, and they offer protection for the employer. So my advice would be to get a, a robust contract and employment policies in place from day one um, when you start engaging employees. Um, in Europe, in any country within Europe. So just to, to touch on then some common employment issues that in my experience tend to surprise US uh, clients and US employers that have operations in Europe. Um, I suppose the first is just immigration rights. It's important to bear in mind that um, a work permit is required for employees who are working in Ireland and in each of the various um, countries within the EU where the individual is a non-EEA national and depending on the country from which the person is coming from there may also be visa requirements that are separate to the work permit requirements so um, these need to be addressed in good time before you're hiring uh, your an employee in Europe um, timelines will vary across each country to to get a work permit or a work visa um, but they, they certainly can take anything from a number of months to, to get that up and running. So it's important to pre-plan in that context. And then also in relation to pre-hire checks, I would say this is also an area that tends to surprise US employers when they are operating in Europe in the sense that um, there is a broad range of background checks that can be carried out on employees pre-hire and during employment in the US whereas there are significant limitations on the extent of permissible background checks that can be carried out in certain jurisdictions in the EU. Um, so for example, criminal background checks um, in Ireland, they would only be permitted in the case of certain limited roles, uh, for example, persons working with children or vulnerable adults, um, or in the security services, private security services. Um, so that can often come as a surprise to US companies who are used to carrying out those checks here in the US. Um, secondly, uh, credit history 
uh, background checks would be quite uncommon in Ireland. Uh, there's very limited circumstances where they're justified. It, it needs to really be relevant to the roles. So for somebody who's working in um, financial type roles, um, where, where it's important to, to cover off any um, background for credit history purposes. Um, similarly, I would say drug testing is quite commonplace in the US in certain industries, but it would be re relatively uncommon in Ireland. And there are limited circumstances, again, where that is permissible. And again, it's, it's, um, it needs to be relevant to the role. For example, somebody perhaps operating um, heavier important machinery or working on a, at a certain stage in the pharmaceutical plant. Um, in those cases, it may be justified, but without each of these background checks, there are data protection concerns that need to be borne in mind as well. And I'll touch on that later when we look at the GDPR, which is coming down the track. And then another issue, uh, again, something Raghu mentioned, and it's, it's um, it's worth restating because I, I can't be overstated is that there is no employment at will in Ireland and it's probably or in the EU in general actually and it's probably the key difference that US employers experience when they're operating in the EU um, so I suppose every employee in Ireland for example would have a contract whether that's expressed or implied um, most employers will provide written contracts of employment and in certain countries there are minimum requirements to provide certain minimum terms in writing so written contracts and written HR policies are commonplace. Um, employees will I suppose have certain minimum notice entitlements um, on termination of their employment. Again this tends to be relative to their length of service and this is notice that either the employee must give if they wish to leave employment or that the employer must give. And they can range in Ireland from between one to eight weeks uh, minimum, which would be, again, as I said, dependent on their rent length of service. In many cases, the employer will provide for a long longer notice period in the contract of employment, again, depending on the role of the employee and how critical um, that person is to the organization. So, an employer can pay in lieu of that minimum notice as well, which is something that should be borne in mind where it is provided for in the employment contract. So this is an example of an area where employment contracts can actually operate to the benefit of an employer. You can introduce certain parameters around entitlements in the contract. Uh, one worth bearing in mind is that employees therefore have unfair dismissal rights in Ireland um, subject to certain exceptions where an employee has one year's continuous service, uh, they're eligible to bring a claim for unfair dismissal. And generally, an employer must be able to prove both a fair reason for dismissal and also show it followed a fair process in order to legitimately defend an unfair dismissal claim. And most cases would tend to be lost on the process uh, that was adopted by the employer in leading to the dismissal rather than the actual reason for it, the dismissal itself. So just to look at some um, other common employment issues, benefits and compensation was an area that Raghu also touched on. So I suppose it's, um, I, won't, I won't labor the point, but worth bearing in mind that employers in Ireland, for example, are not required to provide insured benefits such as health insurance or dental or long-term disability, or they're not required to set up or contribute to a pension plan for their employees. Whereas in the UK, um, auto enrollment of employees into a workplace pension scheme is required if they're not already in one. Um, I think it's worth mentioning share-based remuneration because most companies, in my experience, will want to incentivize their employees with stock options or other equity awards, um, and particularly companies that are in expansion mode. Um, but it's important that companies take advice on this and carefully review any applicable tax treatment and regulatory restrictions that are in place in the country in which the employees are based uh, before they make those equity grants because there can be tax implications and it, it can be a good idea often to localize any share option plans 
or um, get tax advice on the on the most efficient tax structure for for offering those benefits. I think it's worth uh, touching also on collective bargaining requirements in the sense that um, in many countries across the EU, works councils will be a requirement and they will be commonplace. Um, in Ireland, they're extremely rare. Um, France and Germany would be the counterpart where they can play a significant role in day-to-day -day operational management and decision-making. So again, I think that's a factor that should be considered by companies when they're looking to expand overseas. And just to mention, post-termination restrictions also it tends to be an issue that is um, quite often litigated in the US and and um, there are various differences I suppose between the protections that employees in Ireland um, have and employers can avail of uh, as compared with the US so as a general rule you can assume that post-termination restrictions are void across the EU for being a restraint in trade, um, but certain limited restrictions may be enforceable where they are um, limited in scope, they don't go any further than necessary to protect what is a legitimate interest on the part of the employer. Um, so, I, for example, in certain jurisdictions like France and Germany, a portion of the employee's remuneration is required to be paid during a non-compete period. Um, but this wouldn't be the case in Ireland, for example, um, where tailored restrictions can be enforceable and um, provided they're appropriately drafted. So just to move on then to the uh, GDPR, which is a very hot topic at the moment um, across the US and across Europe, um, employers are getting ready to prepare for it. Um, it becomes law on the 25th of May this year. It's a new law designed to harmonize data privacy laws across the <laughs> And many of the principles will remain the same, but the consequences of the breach will be more serious. Um, so there will be national implementation laws in each country. And I suppose there's a huge emphasis on transparency and accountability. So it has very much impact implications for employers in the sense of the transfer of data, the retention of data, um, monitoring employee behavior, and also the rights that employees or data subjects have to request a copy of their information. So in terms of my recommendations for practical steps to comply with the GDPR, um, I would say top tips would be to consider if there is a practical way to comply with various data subject access rights. And um, in, in many cases, this will involve reviewing your current systems and processes and putting in place a slick process to um, monitor data, to um, consider what data you are collecting, why you're collecting it, um, what's the justification for collecting it, and, and also assess how long you're keeping the data. Um, it's important to review outsourcing and processing agreements as well as privacy policies and, and update those policies um, for compliance with the GDPR. And also training of employees is, is key to ensure that employees are aware of data privacy, that they're trained to spot potential data breaches. There's going to be mandatory data breach reporting um, under the GDPR, so this is an area that, that really should be um, covered off with any training and awareness in, in organizations. And then just to move on briefly to touch on Brexit, um, hard to get away from, I suppose, talking about Brexit in any seminar or webinar. Um, it tends to be, along with the GDPR, a hot topic. Um, I would say the biz biggest issue facing employers is the extent to which Brexit will bring about restrictions on the free movement of workers. Um, so currently EEA nationals can can enjoy the right to work remotely in any country um, and once the UK leaves this may be impacted. Um, with Ireland there is an anticipated influx of foreign direct investment which is expected to create jobs and lead to increased competition for talent in certain areas and also we need to consider works councils 
Um, currently, Works Councils can be established to facilitate information and consultation between employee reps and their employer. And many of those arrangements and agreements are governed by UK law. So, um, it, in many cases, a lot of our clients are now looking to reassign those Works Council agreements to new EU member states and they're looking at the various governing laws of countries within the EU and Ireland is being selected as a, an appropriate jurisdiction to locate those in many cases um, given that it has very light Works Council involvement and um, there's many similarities in terms of Ireland and the EU in terms of linguistic and legal and political um, structures also. Well, I suppose a direct implication of Brexit that I would just summarise and finish up on is the uncertainty that it is creating for employers doing business across the UK and we're certainly seeing this in practice in terms of um, employers looking at other jurisdictions um, or, or just considering what the impact might be if they do remain in the UK. So that's it for me. I have a slide there with key takeaways, but I think uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's um, plan wisely, start off on the right foot, consider why is your business expanding and uh, what kind of footprint you do hope to have. So that's Geraldine, all. thank you so much. So Geraldine, I just want to, and everybody on the on the call, just want to. I'm glad that I worked out the technical issues, and now I'm able to uh, speak. Um, just a little bit about uh, what who Global PEO Services are. We're a, a PEO organization in 100 plus countries outside of the United States. Um, our whole focus is to help companies expand internationally and to do it in a few different ways. And um, you'll see the term EOR on there. That stands for employer of record. Uh, that's the co common term in, in Europe when it comes to PEOs. So I just wanted to explain that a little bit. And my name is Adam Sheffield, and I'm the president of Global PEO Services, and I've been in the HCM world for about 15 years now. The next slide is going to talk a little bit about the, um, job being covered a little bit of this, is the employee versus contractor. What makes sense and, and, what, and what doesn't? Um, a couple of things that you need to keep in mind when you consider how you're going to expand internationally is to, is to figure out what's the legal structure going to be. Um, and we'll talk about what, which makes sense around the branch or subsidiary, or maybe a PEO might make sense um, to hire your employees. Or what about um, a contractor? Um, one of the, you know, Geraldine has done a great job to explain some of the challenges and risks around a, a contractor. Some things to keep in mind, we talked about intellectual property as a concern. Um, making sure that you're you're classifying them correctly. The other challenge is we found that companies that go that path have a hard time finding the right type of employees that are willing to accept uh, being a contractor. It's kind of foreign to them, um, especially in the EU, on how that works. Uh, you know, they're not as familiar with it as, as we are in the United States. So those are some of the, the risks and challenges that are faced when you go that direction. But when you're, when, the next slide we'll talk about when you're considering to expand international, these are things you need to keep in mind. Um, in my experience, it's very rare that you have kind of this one-size-fits-all approach as you expand internationally into different countries. Things you need to consider, what are the objective, objectives in that country? What are you trying to accomplish? What's happening in that space? Um, you know, what, what will be, what, what type of services are you going to be providing or solutions are you going to be selling or whatever the case might be in those countries? Um, are you, you know, those things have to be taken into consideration because it might um, put you in a situation where you might have a permanent establishment if you're trying to put up, you know, uh, some type of warehouse or whatever the case might be, that might be a challenge. The other thing you have to consider is headcount. Um, you know, what's your footprint going to be like in that country? What is it today? What does it look like in the future? Those are things you need to, you know, consider. Um, sometimes when you look at large headcounts, you know, something like a PEO won't make sense. Obviously, subsidiary will. Um, so some of those things, those to get to get the right guidance on what makes sense would be helpful. The other thing to consider is speed. Uh, we see this all the time. Uh, companies, a lot of HR directors are told after the fact that they've hired somebody internationally, <laughs> they're trying to figure out how are they going to now onboard that employee? Um, how are they going to do that properly? So speed is a, an important thing to consider. Um, when you're looking at how you're going to expand. You had one client that it took a year and a half to open up a bank account in the EU, one of the EU countries. 
Um, there are challenges associated with that. It's not as easy as, as what it is in the United States when it comes to incorporation and registrations. So those things you have to consider. And then what's, what's your kind of risk threshold? Um, if you're going to do a subsidiary or a, a branch, um, do you have the expertise around the em employment laws? Uh, do you have the HR expertise? Who's going to help you with the collective bargaining agreements? Those type of things you need to, to understand and figure out um, to find out which is the right model for you to expand overseas into that country. Um, when you look at the next slide here, this kind of gets in a little bit more detailed around what an employer of record service or a PEO service internationally does. Um, obviously, does the onboarding of the employee, does the um, employee contracts that Geraldine's been talking about and Ragu has talked about, making sure that the benefits and all those things are, are onboarded properly for the employee, but then also ongoing and making sure that they're um, in compliance with the local laws and what things might be needed in that country for that employee. All payroll related items, money movement, bank account stuff, those are things you're not going to have to worry about when you go into an employer record type of model. Um, you know that the contracts are going to be um, compliant or they should be. And then one of the things to consider is does this you know, organization, if you go down the PEO model, does it have some type of system that can track your employees? Do you have good visibility of those employees? Or are you losing that completely? And then, you know, obviously you go into knowing that the visa piece, can they handle those type of things for you? And then the compliance and reporting, are you giving those things back that they're getting handled properly in that given country for you? And the next slide talks about, you know, kind of why, right? Why companies go with a PEO um, internationally. And, I, and I, I'm not gonna go through each one of these kind of bullet points on the slide, but I will tell you a couple of examples. We, we've had many clients that, uh, you know, are spinoffs from a larger organization, um, and they have, you know, international employees in multiple different countries, and all of a sudden they find themselves on how are they going to now onboard these employees? Uh, they don't have any, uh, you know, they have no subsidiary or branch set up or established. They don't have no entity established in those countries. They need to transition these employees right away, provide in instant infrastructure and be compliant in those countries right away so they don't lose any any momentum of that kind of spin-off. And so many times we've been able to help um, clients in that aspect. The other thing we see where companies are, are challenged, I kind of mentioned before, where the HR director gets fined, they, they have the last to find out that somebody was onboarded in, in, a, in, in a given country and they're trying to figure that piece out. So they need to move quickly um, to be able to handle that uh, employee properly so they don't lose the talent that they have found and, and they want to make sure they onboard. Um, a couple things to consider, though, I would highly recommend if this is a path you're going, whatever organization you're looking at, you need to make sure that you talk about what I call that transition to your own entity. What's that next stage or next phase of your organization? Get, so, for example, if you're in a, in, in a country and you have a couple of employees, it might not make sense to open up your own entity and subsidiary in that country. Um, and so the PEO model might work. Well, all of a sudden now, let's say you hire, you know, 50 more employees or whatever the case might be in that country. Well, now it makes sense to now get stood up on your own and have your own entity in that country. Um, really talk about what, if you're evaluating this model, what does that transition look like uh, from, a, from a PEO to your own um, entity and how does that work? Um, I think that's a, a critical piece to consider so companies understand and find a good organization that can do that seamlessly and make that process easy. If not, it can put them in a, in a tough spot. Okay. And, and with that, I'm going to uh, kind of open it up, I guess, to questions. Or Maggie, back to you for questions yeah, that we you, might Adam. have. For um, so we have just a couple more minutes here um, to answer a couple of questions. If you do have any additional questions that were asked um, that may not be answered right now, we will get back to you via email. Um, so the first question we have is about the reduction in workforce in European countries. Do you have any top tips? Geraldine, do you have any input on this? Yeah, so I can uh, give a high level I suppose, view on it. In terms of uh, the countries, it will, it will vary across country to country. For example, in certain countries such as Netherlands, um, an employer will need a court order to dismiss employees. Um, a consultation with Works Council may be required in other countries. Um, so it really does depend. It, 
generally speaking from an Irish law perspective, and, and the same can be said from the UK, and the emphasis is on a fair procedure once you can establish that you have a, a, a ground for redundancy. Um, and then depending on the threshold, it may trigger information and consultation obligations um, so it's worthwhile getting advice on the particular country in which the, the reduction in force is impacted. Okay, great. Um, so a participant stated that they were very interested in how to manage multi-country payroll and benefits as they've had many challenges getting this off the ground. Do you have any suggestions? Um, maybe Adam, you could take this one. Sure, absolutely. I, I think one of the challenges, if they're having a hard time getting something like that off the ground, they're probably doing it individually. Um, by country and they have different systems in place and so it can be very difficult to manage. You know, our recommendation would be to look at an organization that can handle multi-country payroll in one system to give you good visibility and, and also an HCM solution that is centralized that gives you good visibility across the globe that have multiple languages in it. So it actually does become your global system of truth. Um, so that's where I think people have a hard time is they, they decentralize all these different systems and processes and that can be challenging. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one more question. Which countries in Europe are good to set up an international operational hub in? Raghu, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think this goes back to the what I started my conversation about location. So it really depends on what you are trying to achieve. There are lots of countries that have good manufacturing options, but there are lots of countries that have good R&D type uh, engineering talent uh, obviously from a sales perspective it depends on what your product is you may need to you may want to go into germany your france some of the biggest uh, economies in the eu uh, or you may have a unique product that you may want to need to go to the scandinavian countries because that might be your target market so do your research figure out why you're going versus just saying hey i want to go global let me just go open an office in the UK. UK does look very similar to US in terms of rules, regulations, uh, environment, language, things like that. Um, but uh, if you go into the con into any country for the wrong reason, you are at some point going to have to pull out. And most times, going in is much easier than pulling out. It can take a year to two years to wind down. Uh, not that we want to talk about that, but those are realities of life that come home to roost in case you have made bad decisions. So the idea is always do your research, do a little homework, consult with the advisors, whether it's somebody like Global Upside or somebody like Matheson uh, or somebody like Global PEO Services in terms of their expertise, their knowledge base and stuff and capitalize on that for your for your plans. Great. Well, that wraps things up. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, we'll be sending out a copy, as I mentioned before, of the webinar and the slide decks. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.